is Radu Grosso. I am a professor at Technische Universität Vienna, uh, and I'm the head of the Cyberphysical Systems Group of the Faculty of Informatics. So I'm going to talk about uh, neural circuit policies uh, enabling uh, auditable uh, autonomy. Our inspiration comes from uh, C. elegans, which is a very small worm, uh, less than one millimeter length and 0 0.01 millimeter uh, width. And uh, being so small, uh, it's 302 neurons uh, can communicate with that, each other without attenuation, without using spiking. Uh, we consider that spiking is a very important uh, implementation issue. It's like uh, analog to digital conversion. Uh, and it's in, very important for implementation, but not from the point of view of learning. Uh, the nematode has around 8,000 synapses and uh, 95 actuators, which are the body wall muscles. Uh, together, they allow amazing uh, associated learning capabilities and social behavior capabilities for uh, this neuron, for, for, for this small uh, And the elegance nematode. Like any cell in the, uh, in the body of every organism, uh, a cell has a membrane and membranes fat. So as a consequence, it's an insulator. And there is a concentration of ions outside the cell and the concentration of ions inside the cell. And the difference in the concentration of these ions defi defines a membrane potential, the B. Okay, this is the, for example, cell I, so it has a, a membrane potential VI. And uh, since uh, this is an insulator, it acts as a capacitor. So you can write for the membrane of the neuron, you can write the capacitor equation where the rate of change of uh, uh, the membrane potential is the sum of its currents. Now there is a lot going on inside even these uh, small neurons of uh, C. elegans. So we are going to simplify them for the purpose of machine learning by concentrating uh, only on three currents, the leaking current that you see here, uh, the synaptic currents, the chemical synapses, and the gap junction currents, which are the electric synapses of, uh, uh, of the neuron. So what are these currents? So the leakage current is essentially a, a proportional uh, controller, uh, where the error is the difference of potential between the resting potential and the membrane potential, and the proportionality constant is uh, the conductance. But then there is a gap junction current, which is also a proportional controller, where the error is the difference of potential between the two neurons, and the proportionality co uh, constant is the uh, conductance between the two neurons. It's just a small channel that uh, resists to the exchange of ions. But the most important one are the chemical synapses, because this is where uh, learning happens. So how does uh, this happen? So what you have, you have these bubbles filled with neurotransmitters uh, that come through the axon to the synapse. There they bind to the synapse and they open and release neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters then go and bind to the receptors of these channels that you see here. And uh, when they bind to the channels, they open them. Okay, so uh, as, uh, now you can write a very complicated differential equation about what is going on here, uh, but this is actually simplified uh, by assuming that there is a maximum conductance, GSIJ, and then there is a, a, a presynaptic uh, potential uh, based uh, uh, conductance, okay? It varies with the presynaptic uh, uh, membrane potential. And then there is uh, also this, in, this is a conductance, and uh, this has to be multiplied with the difference of potential uh, such that uh, you, you get a current. Now, if uh, the difference of potential is positive, then ions flow inside, so the, the synapse is activating. And if uh, the difference of potential is negative, then this uh, expresses the fact that ions are flowing uh, outside, like the, this chlor uh, ion, which is negative, it flows outside, and as a consequence, the, the synapse is uh, inhibiting. Now, the entire differential equation, behavior, concentration, uh, the concentration of uh, neurotransmitters, the rate of binding to the uh, uh, receptors and the rate of opening, all of this is captured with a very nice sigmoidal equation, which might be familiar to you from uh, artificial neural networks. 
So actually it doesn't happen in the neuron, it happens in the synapse uh, and it has this nice, nice shape that depends on the presynaptic potential. And mu is uh, actually the threshold, the, what is called firing threshold wrongly because these neurons are not spiking. And so there is no firing going on here. It's just a, a very smooth uh, uh, function, sigmoidal function. Now, what can you do with this? You can have uh, various uh, uh, policy motives, uh, like for example, activation, as I was telling you, inhibition. You can have a coupling when you have a gap junction between the two neurons. I mean, the more interesting are the, the one uh, that corresponds to feedback connection. The connections like uh, the sequencing where you have activation and inhibition, uh, the conservation. So sequencing means uh, X goes first and then Y goes. Uh, conservation means they go, uh, they behave essentially the same way is also a way of uh, implemented, uh, implementing fault tolerance. And uh, sorry for that. And then you have mutual exclusion or a selection. So you see when X goes high, uh, y goes low. All right, so what can you do with this kind of primitives? Let me give you an example. So suppose you have a, uh, an expression theta greater than x. Now in compilers, you might have learned that you create a, a abstract syntax tree for it where you have theta and x as the inputs and then you have a comparator there that says greater than or equal. Now, how can you implement this with, uh, with neurons? So first, uh, you can say uh, theta and x are sensory neurons. Then you have an interneuron which uh, does the comparison. And then you want to do something with it. So you take, for example, the sequencing uh, primitive. So the first neuron activates the second and that second inhibits the first. So which means that the first neuron is active and, uh, and the second neuron would become active uh, when theta is less than x, okay? When, when uh, this is, uh, uh, this neuron so to say is high. Okay, so this can implement a while loop. And uh, within this while loop, uh, uh, you can have a, an activation of, uh, of a motor neuron, uh, which says go back. Now you might ask, okay, so what's the big deal? Because we already have this in uh, programming languages. The main idea is that this circuit that you think of, see on the left and you see it uh, on, the, on the right as a while loop, has parameters that are learned automatically, like the threshold theta and the strength of going back. With what uh, velocity are you uh, going to go back? All right, so using these uh, primitives, you can do design. For example, uh, you can implement a lane keeping uh, uh, controller where you have a camera input stream and then you have a set of four le le levels of convolutions to extract features from the, from the camera stream. And this serves as our sensory neurons, the 32 features that we get from the, uh, from the convolutional layers. And uh, these sensory neurons are connected then to 12 interneurons. So the, these 12 interneurons process, process the sensory information uh, appropriately for, uh, for the command neurons, okay? Uh, the six command neurons and the command neurons steer then the motor neuron. Uh, now this uh, interconnection between the neurons is learned. Okay, also, so all the synapses and their strengths uh, have, have to be learned. And, uh, but uh, what is nice about this is that we have only 19 neurons explaining the lane keeping. And uh, for example, this one says turn left slightly, turn stronger left and turn very strong left. And the other ones say turn right, turn stronger right and turn very strong right. And when, when all of them are disabled, you go straight. Okay, so now, these neurons are connected, for example, left right are mutually with each other. So if you turn left, you turn right at this time. Okay, so what can you do with that? Okay, so now sit back and relax, and I hope you can, uh, uh, can hear. Can you hear my, my presentation? Uh, Hello? Yes, yes, audio is coming through. Now you see our uh, network in action. So the attention map shows you where you are looking. So it focuses to the horizon. You can see the attention map below.
the networks are much smaller than the state of the art. So by the way, uh, this is driving important. So the networks are highly robust to environmental perturbations. Like uh, here you see the, uh, the input actually gets distorted by the rain. And you can see the attention may match space focus, even if the input is not this. By the way, this is my PhD student, uh, Matthias Lechner, driving in uh, the streets of Boston, to the outside of Boston. So these circuits are for near certain policy. So this is a new generation of deep uh, models, neighbor visualization. They are more robust and uh, auditable. So this is joint work with IST, uh, Vienna, and uh, with MIT was published in Nature, uh, Machine Intelligence, but it was not only uh, published in Nature, Machine Intelligence, it was uh, also, uh, it made it on the cover of, uh, of Nature, which was for us very nice. Uh, and uh, uh, here you can see uh, the state of the art. Uh, let me start it here. So you have the controller, 1,100 neurons, so they are in two layers. So this is also a convolutional neural network with two layers. And now you see the attention map, uh, how it looks like. I mean, it's a mess. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to be driven by such a car because it really concentrates outside. And you're going to see now when it gets to the, to the steep curve, uh, it's going to make an accident. I mean, it's going to get out of the, of the street. It's going to stop for a second and then continue. So this is a state of the art end to end deep learning for uh, uh, autonomous driving. You can replace a controller with uh, uh, something that is called uh, continuous time recurrent neural networks that you see here. So in this case, you have 64 of them and they are connected all to all. So it's very, very hard to explain what they are doing. It's almost impossible. And again, here you see when they take the, the turn, the curve here, they, they get in trouble. And it uh, went actually out of the street and then it had to come back. So you see the, the, uh, the uh, video stopped for a second. And uh, the most popular uh, uh, recurrent neural networks are the LSTMs developed by the way in Austria uh, by Hochreiter. And here you see, uh, here we have 64 of them. Uh, they, they perform somewhat better. And now you are going to see what happens on the steep curve. So they also uh, get out of street because they look also too much everywhere. So it's not so clear. It's uh, more difficult to distinguish the, uh, you know, the, the road from, uh, from the outside of the road. So you can see it, it focuses also on the outside. It focuses most of, mostly on the road itself, but uh, uh, it also looks a lot uh, to what's happening uh, left and right uh, on the outside of the road. All right, so this is uh, what we have done. So similar technology we have used for uh, 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 in, in this Grand Prix uh, Berlin of our autonomous racing uh, that was this time, uh, in fact, uh, in, a, in a simulated environment. Uh, and uh, it's, these were my students uh, that, uh, so obviously we used AI techniques uh, uh, in order to, uh, to win, in fact, the race. All right, so uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much again. Uh, I'm going to be happy to, uh, to answer your questions uh, in the Q&A session.